Thank you very much, Dr. Ramnarain, County Medical Officer of Health, County of St. Patrick. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. David Ibalami, Specialist Medical Officer, Insect Vector Control Division, and also Mr. Arnold Ramkaran, Acting Public Health Inspector for Insect Vector Central Division. These gentlemen are key resource persons of the ministry, especially uh, during this 2018 rainy season. Next, I'd like to invite the lectern captain, retired Neville Wint, who is the relief officer and officer in charge of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, ODPM. Captain Wint. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Honorable Minister, members of the head table, persons present here, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Minister, on behalf of the staff of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, and by extension, the Ministry of National Security, I thank you for inviting us to be part of this interagency briefing. And, ladies and gentlemen, this press conference, which highlights the issue of interagency, interoperability, and collaboration for disaster risk management, is a critical role as we prepare not only for the hurricane season but also for all hazards to which Sri and Tobago can be impacted. Any scale of emergency response is characterized by consistently changing task demands, collaboration with and between first responder and support agencies, and in some cases, the Ministry of Works can be considered as a first responder, and based on the impact, can be also a support or second responder. Such collaborations is difficult at times, but not only for complex incidents, but because we have a diverse composition of people, agencies, all working together, all of whom possess different skills, procedures, knowledge, and competencies. The ODPM has, in the past, been successful in achieving its mandate as a state strategic coordinating agency in managing hazard impacts that affects Trinidad and Tobago. The Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management has and is continuing its checks and balances to ensure responders and, by extension, the population is in a state of readiness, not only for the 2018 Atlantic hurricane season, but for all identified hazards that can impact our Twin Island state. We have made some necessary adjustments based on lessons learned from the last season, both locally and regionally, we have improved or and strengthened our programs. There have been a number of consultations with agencies such as the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Health, and other entities, all who have a critical role to play. The Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government has assured me that shelters are not only ready, but steps are also being taken to ensure that the population is aware of where these shelters are and their management structures are in place. From the ODPM perspective, supplies for shelter management uh, activation are ready and sufficient, and we stand ready to support an all-of-government response to any hazard impact, especially in the Atlantic hurricane season. The necessary public education programs are being carried out to ensure that the population have the necessary information in an effort to allow them to get ready and stay ready for the hurricane season. This is also, has been done with the launch of the ODPM Hurricane Guide, which is available on our website, which gives various tips of how persons should get ready and stay ready, and how they should respond to the various hazard impact. The ODPM is pleading with the population of Trinidad and Tobago to be extra vigilant during this season especially those persons living in low-lying areas, conducting business and even recreation. We are also appealing for persons to pay a particular attention to the weather forecasts, tidal information, and bulletins being issued by the various agencies so authorized to do. Ladies and gentlemen, notwithstanding the prediction of the 2018 hurricane season, it takes only one organized system to cause damage and as such, persons are reminded not to leave anything to chance. God is not a Trinidadian. 
or as we say, God is not a trini. We are also, ladies and gentlemen, still in an active earthquake zone, and we remind us that this was reminded to us in the last three weeks when we had an earthquake, and we all felt it at certain parts of the island. As the Ministry of Health continues with its drive from an all-hazard approach, which also is in keeping with the government all-hazard approach and that interagency collaboration, the state of the nation's readiness to me is at a state where I could, I'm proud to say we are ready. However, the severity of the impact will test our readiness. It will test not only the readiness of the responding entities, the readiness of every individual in Trinidad and Tobago. So as we engage and as the ODPM supports the Ministry of Health, the underlying request and plea is that each member of the population take every step to ensure that they are ready, be educated, because as I said, it only takes one organized system, one event. Climate change is impacting us. We are now seeing what is now referred to as concentrated rainfalls, where basically, as what I thought has been experienced on the first, where in one hour we had 16 milliliters of 16 milliliters of um, water coming down on us. And then within the next 45 minutes, we had 84 with a high tide. So there was nothing that could have been done to mitigate that flooding impact, but accept that it's, it's going to be flooded. So again, ladies and gentlemen, I employ all of us here to get ready and stay ready, be informed, be educated, and the, to the minister, sir, the UDPM stands ready to support any hazard impact, not only to your ministry, but to any and every agency and the population at large. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you very much, Captain Wint, Relief Officer and Officer in Charge at the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, the UDPM. I would just like to inform the, the media that the hurricane guide is enclosed in your media package. And I went through the document. It's a very comprehensive document. I do hope you'll find some parts to take out and share with the, the public. At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Jamil Mohammed, the Director of Environmental Health in the Municipal and Regional Corporations, to address us. Mr. Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, this, good morning, everyone. The Honorable Minister of Health, uh, Mr. Terence Dial Singh, uh, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Parasram, Dr. Ram Narayan, County Medical Officer, St. Patrick, Captain Wind of the ODPM, uh, other invited guests and members, other in invited members. Morning. First, uh, I need to apologize on behalf of the minister for his inability to attend. Uh, he had under prior commitments and he sends his apologies. When we think about the rainy season, the rainy season is not only about disasters, it's about epidemics also. And we talk about flooding, we talk about vector-borne diseases, and that includes that includes mosquito and rodent problems. The Minister of Health has mandated the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government to formulate strategies to mitigate impacts to the citizenry when it comes to, when it comes to those things. Firstly, we are aware of the corporation's responsibility as having the first, be, to be the first responders Therefore, the disaster management unit attached to each corporation has made all efforts to have ensure the drainage maintenance systems works are, conduct, are conducted. So I, I need to explain to you all what we have done up to now and what 
of our response uh, to the disasters entail. So the ministry has, through the municipal corporation, is responsible for clearing of minor water courses and drains, as well as the removal of bulk, regular, and bulk waste. Now, the, we have reached about 75% in terms of these minor drains. We have teamed up with the Ministry of Works to desilt water courses. With the recent CPEP launch, their Clean TT initiative last Friday, where we are using the, in, that enterprise to keep our country clean every day, cutting road verges and clearing river banks and drains. But we are moving beyond just cleaning. We have to make physical changes as well. All corporations have multiple drainage infrastructure projects for this fiscal year. Many have already started, and some will be starting soon. But we have challenges. And we have challenges in terms of we need cultural changes, in terms of Ill illegal dumping, unauthorized development, and adhering to the building codes, stop littering, and change our consumption habits. For instance, illegal dumping. While visiting the corporations during and after the cleanup campaign, you, may, you have seen how huge the problem of illegal dumping is across the country. You have pers personal, personally seen dump sites at Kuva Tabakit, Tunapuna Piaku, Pinal Devi with old tires, derelict vehicles, household waste, and mattresses. During the cleanup campaign, we, we pulled multiple TVs, television sets, from the drain in front of Price, Price Plaza, showing that more than one person used this as a disposal method instead of doing the right thing. Corporations have bulk refused pickup up, so citizens should call for these services, as, and we have placed these numbers uh, at, at convenient areas. Rather than do things the wrong way, provide minister with bulk garbage numbers in case you need them. Right. So we have provided those numbers to the corporate to the citizenry. Unauthorized development buildings, particularly hillside and river banks, developments can cause the denudation of the hills and, and therefore cause rapid runoff. This overloads the capacity of water courses with sediment and anything else that washes down with erosion, like trees or other debris and can cause blockages. Some developments divert water courses or cause blockages that might not affect them, but will affect neighboring communities lower down. Municipal corporations are working to serve stop show cause notices in, in the instance of unauthorized construction. Agricultural practice of damning. We all know that uh, people involved in, in farming and so on, agricultural, agricultural farming, they, they block the water courses for irrigation during the dry season and sometimes not removed in the preparation for the rainy season. And this again contributes to flooding. We have engaged in, in public education and have been working to educate the public on the services available to them so that these public health hazards are prevented. We have to change our habits if we want to really get anywhere in solving the pervasive problem of flooding, because no amount of cleaning will help if we continue to indiscriminately throw garbage through the car window. Every single bottle that, pla that doesn't get disposed of properly ends up in the waterways. When we have every rains, like Sunday last, Driving through Glencoe and St. James, you could see the piles of bottles that had washed down or overflowed from the underground drains. I don't know if anybody has been on a boat along the coastline when rain is falling on the mainland and see what comes out of the rivers to the ocean. I think once every now and then you have this um, cleanup of the beachfronts and you see what comes out of the rivers. We should take pride in our surroundings and keep the country clean. Start with our own properties and extend into other communities. So how do municipal corporations respond to flooding disaster? 
each municipal municipality follows the disaster cycle. We mitigate, and if we, we, if we mitigate and we still have problem, we, we have to respond, we provide relief, we rebuild, and we continue to, to take action where necessary. Mitigate refers to the cutting of dangerous trees, clearing blockages in known problem areas, having stakeholder meetings to train volunteers and stakeholders in community emergency response, shelter management. Basic first aid and incident command systems. Prevent our pre-event, our disaster management units have also started driving around to flood prone areas, distributing sandbags as a preventive measure. This, this helps us to be in a state of readiness before the rainy season starts, making the impact less. Response, our first response, we do initial damage and needs assessment in which we gather information that will assist victims immediately and in the short term and in the short and long term. Relief, we utilize an all of co cooperation and all of government approach. The DMUs provide relief items from stakeholders and coordinates with other agencies and corporate citizens doing the same. So we can manage distribution and ensure that the whole affected community receives assistance. We build, in terms of rebuilding, we partner with agencies like the Ministry of Works, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, Fire, fire the, the, the Ministry of Works in terms of Fire Division 2, WASA, T and Tech, ODPM. We assist through the deployment of equipment and grant application process. Our disaster personnel have recently been trained in the disaster relief grant application process by the Ministry of Social Development so that we can help people fill out these forms sooner, soon, as, sooner, as sooner they can restore their homes after a disaster. Continuity. This is about follow-up to ensure that restoration of homes after disaster takes place to completion after event. We have launched the disaster management hotlines for each of the, corp of the 14 corporations this year. This has helped with reducing response time to persons in need. We talk about a whole co of corporation approach, but we really need is a whole country approach. You can volunteer in your community, and you can help your friends and neighbors get prepared. Continue to keep the surroundings clean. And just remember, the four R's, it, it, is used to be, it used to be three, but we have added a new one for World Environment Day. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. We can follow this to help us adopt more sustainable practices together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Your presentation certainly spoke to the need for significant behavior change by our population. And of course, the need to educate, to inform, and some probably, probably some form of enforcement is necessary as well. The Minister of Health, the Honorable Terrace Dial Singh, has kindly consented to make an address. Honorable Minister. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Roshan Parasram, Dr. Kalicharan Ramnarain, County Medical Officer of Health of County St. Patrick, my colleague from representing the Ministry of National Security, Captain Retired Neville Wint, and Mr. Jamil Mohammed, Director of Environmental Health in the Municipal and Regional Corporations. Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. Members of the media, welcome to this inter-ministry and inter-agency media conference because we cannot do this alone. The reason why the Ministry of Health has chosen the southern region to officially launch our program about flooding and rainy season is that this region is more prone uh, to being flooded out. 
And when you have a region more prone to being flooded out, what goes hand in hand are diseases and conditions that arise out of flooding. So that is your rationale for coming down to San Fernando this morning. The Ministry of Health is no longer focused on being a port of Spain thing. The Ministry of Health is about 1.3 million people in Trinidad and Tobago. That's why I've been holding many press conferences in South over the past year or so. So we are here to launch our very proactive strategy into how to mitigate diseases coming out of flooding. Part of this is to increase public awareness, public education. Because although it's an interagency and interministerial press conference, it's a triangle. It's not only interministry, interagency. There's always a component that is missing. And the most important component, and the most important component that contributes to flooding is what? Anybody could tell, tell me? The public. The public. Recently on Labor Day, when we had all those heavy rains, I was fortunate enough to be up in the west that day near to the Diego Martin River, where the Diego Martin River goes out into the sea. And you know what I saw with my own two eyes coming down the Diego Martin River? A fridge, several tires, grocery cart, bamboo. And then we ask ourselves, what is the government doing? Whenever there's one finger pointing at the government, whenever the public points a finger at the government, there are always four fingers pointing back at the public. So part of this is public education. A lot of flooding could be mitigated by responsible actions on the part of the public as to how they dispose of their household appliances, their old tires, bamboo, garbage bags. You see garbage bags full of garbage coming down the river. You saw a photograph of the Dago Martin River where somebody poured unused concrete into the Dago Martin River by a bridge. It hardened. It decreases the volume capacity of the river. And when the bamboo and everything jams up against that, you create a dam and you create flooding. So there's a role for all of us to play. But let's focus on the Ministry of Health's response to flooding and the rainy season in general. Candice, were you able to get the slide up for me? No? Just this. So I have a slide which I want to show you which is going to show you how effective we have been in the ministry in treating with mosquito-borne diseases. I will try to have the slide WhatsApp to members of the media um, so you will get a copy. I have it on my phone. I will send, send it out. So this is the slide that shows the media how we have been dealing with mosquito-borne diseases. Let's see if you can get the whole thing right. Brilliant. Stop, stop there. So, we have been tracking over the past two and a half years, 2016 for the entire year, 2017 for the entire year, and 2018, whatever figures we give you for 2018, which is this year, is up to July, uh, June the 11th, 2018. June the 11th, which is basically half of the year. We are going to be showing you how our incidences of Zika, chikungunya, and dengue have been coming down dramatically. However, what we are going to be giving you as a message is that you cannot judge the success of our insect vector plans by either Zika or chikungunya, and I will explain why. So if you look at 2016 Zika, confirmed 717 cases. 2017 confirmed one case. 
So we went from 717 in 2016 to one case in 2016. You realize what a massive drop that is. And for 2018, up to June the 11th, you had zero confirmed cases. But that is not a good marker of why our insect vector planning and execution of planning has been successful. I would like to say that, but it is not. The reason being, the current science tells us that once a person or a population, once Zika passes through a population, once you are bitten by the mosquito that carries Zika, the current thinking is that you are immune for life. So everybody who got bitten in 2016 by the mosquito and they got Zika, they would not get it again. So you understand now why I'm saying Zika is not a good marker for the success of our, of our insect vector. You got it, right? Look at chikungunya. 2016, confirmed cases, nine. 2017, confirmed cases, zero. And 2018, up until June the 11th, confirmed cases, zero. Again, you cannot use the data for chikungunya to tell you that the plans are working. Because like Zika, which is one strain of the Zika virus, chikungunya is one strain of the chikungunya virus. Once you get chikungunya, you will not get it again for life. That is the current thinking. You are immune for life. It doesn't mean that the chikungunya virus isn't there. It means you got it once, you're not going to contract it again. The real success of our insect vector management and the real success of how we have been managing mosquito-borne diseases is dengue. Before I explain the figures, unlike Zika and chikungunya, which is one strain, you get it once, you have immunity for life. Dengue is four strains, four, four strains. So you could get strain one this year. If you are unlucky, you could get bitten next year, get strain two. If you are unlucky, you could get bitten the following year, you get strain three, and so on. So Z dengue is the only marker that tells us how successful we are. Because you could get dengue multiple times. Because you have four strains. So look at the figures now for dengue. For the whole of 2016, you had confirmed 81 cases. For 2017, confirmed eight cases. That is the marker. That tells you we have been highly successful in managing mosquito-borne diseases and managing the Aedes aegypti. 2018, up until June the 11th, Two cases. So two cases so far for June, up until June 2018, but for the whole of 2016, you had 81. That is a remarkable achievement. And I want to thank everybody in Insect Vector. Give them a round of applause. All the Insect Vector people stand up and be recognized. Dr. Bellamy, the inspectors, everybody. These are the people. Yeah, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up, inspectors. These are the people who have brought these results to us. And you owe them a debt of gratitude. These are the people. Thank you very much. What have we done at the ministry that gives us these fantastic results? In tw 2016, we started to move this country to the use of technology. Via IDB loan, we were able to purchase a GIS system. That was then supplemented this year by a donation from the British High Commission, where you now have inspectors going out into the field with handheld devices, tablets, and they could actually track these things real time in front of your house. So we are marrying our GIS system, which we got in 2016, 
with the donation from the British High Commission, and that I hope in 2018 will continue this path of excellence. The population and the media always asks, because the, the knee-jerk reaction to mosquito-borne diseases is, why don't you spray more? So let me explain why you can't spray more. There has been no new chemical to treat mosquitoes developed for 20 years. So for the past two decades, the world, our global chemists, our global agency, CDC, WHO, whatever, they have not come up with any new chemicals to treat the Aedes aegypti. So we have to rely on the same chemicals for the past 20 years. Therefore, if you spray more often with the same old chemicals, what do you think happens? The mosquitoes develop resistance. That is why you can't spray more than a four-month cycle, I believe it is. It's a four-month cycle. You see how we're learning, eh? So we have a cycle of spraying any one area every four months. But people say, of course, spray every month. You can't, because then you'll be creating a bigger problem. You will then have a mosquito that is totally resistant to every known chemical known to man. That is why spraying has to be judicious on a four-month cycle, and that is why we have to rely on technology and that is why we have to rely on law enforcement. Source reduction at the point of where? The householder. And that is why in 2016, I got the cabinet to agree to change the Yellow Fever Act to increase the fines for people who have unkempt premises from a measly $300, which was no longer a deterrent, to $3,500. That is a deterrent. And to date, at the last count, we had six persons before the courts. Never before in the history of this country have we been actively taking individuals before the courts under the Yellow Fever Act. So the response to mosquito-borne diseases is not only spraying. It is a response based on using technology, Yes, spraying, and also law enforcement under the AGs of the Ministry of Health. And that is why the figures are what they are. That is why dengue, you remember the good old, no, the bad old days when you open the papers every morning and somebody is dying of den dengue, or in a hospital needing blood transfusions and all that? That is why dengue has moved from 81 confirmed in 2016. And before 2016, if I show you the figures, there were only 200s, 300s, 400s of confirmed cases. So the decline has not been steady. The decline has been precipitous. You have moved from 81 in 2016. Pay attention to this. 81, 8. That, my friends, is the marker of success in insect vector management. Coming now to floodborne diseases are, as we are in the rainy season, I want to deal especially with the major concern for floodborne diseases, which is leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, as you know, is a bacteria carried by certain mammals. And there's a bit of theory in the public domain, it is only rats. No, it is not only rats. It is rats and livestock, cattle. So in your farming communities where you have animal husbandry, where you have cattle, cows, whatever, pigs, for those, for pig farmers, the leptospirosis bacteria is not only carried by rats, it is also carried by other livestock like pigs and cattle. 
So in the rainy season, one of the precautions that householders have to take, if you are going to dispose of a carcass, whether it's a cattle, a cow, a pig, or even a rat, you do not hold it in your bare hands. If you are going to venture into floods, wear PPE, wear boots, wear gloves. If you don't have gloves, simple garbage bags will do plastic bags. And handle dead animals and dead rats and dispose of them by protecting yourself. Don't just pick up a dead rat with your hand. Don't handle a dead cow or a dead pig with your hands. You have to protect yourself. So that is leptospirosis. Other floodborne diseases that the Ministry of Health is concerned about, especially in the aftermath of a flood, when people have to venture into floody waters, are gastrointestinal diseases, because in these flooded waters, you have bacteria if you ingest it, you get diarrhea, you get dysentery, and if you're a child or elderly and you dehydrate out, you could die. So these are some of the measures, these are some of the warnings we want to give the people. After the floods have subside, subsided, and now you have mud, which is now caked up, and now dry, and now the breeze starts to blow, and these dust particles are in the air you breathe it in, you are now prone to what? Respiratory problems especially if you are asthmatic. So again, a simple face mask such as available in a pharmacy for a few cents will go a long way for the individual to protect themselves from respiratory diseases. You also have to look out for skin conditions, rashes. You come in contact with flood water, with bacteria and so on, you can get skin conditions. So at the Ministry of Health, we are concerned about all these conditions that could come about if you don't handle yourself well in flooding. Leptospirosis, gastrointestinal problems, breathing problems, respiratory problems, skin conditions, especially for the immunocompromised, especially for children and the elderly. Those are the two subgroups of the population who always carry the burden of these diseases. So what we are doing here this morning is alerting the public and launching our Ministry of Health's response to the rainy season and flooding. The message I want to leave you with this morning again is that the state will do all that it can, but we have to get the message out to the most important stakeholder, which is Mr. and Mrs. Public that they have a role to play in how they dispose of garbage. They have a role to play by going around your homes and making sure you don't have old tires, making sure that your drains are clear, making sure that the receptacles that you collect water in are covered by netting so the mosquitoes can't get in there and build their homes. You have to make sure that your flower pots, you don't overwater your flower pots, and the saucers collect water, and that's where the mosquitoes go. You have to make sure that the vases that you have inside your homes, when your husband gives you a nice bouquet of flowers, the flowers look nice, but you put them into a vase, the water stays there, and you create inside your home a nice haven for mosquitoes. So personal responsibility has a great role to play in our national response to mosquito-borne diseases and also diseases out of flooding. So ladies and gentlemen, those are the few words I have for you this morning. I want to thank the media for coming out and for carrying these important messages as we face the challenges from June, July down to December of this year. Thank you very much, and we'll now be open to questions. Please give your name and media house that you represent before you ask your question. Um, please have your questions related to this morning's uh, topic. 
Um, there should be a microphone, yes, there's a microphone that has been provided. And so I invite you to bring your questions forward. From the Trinidad Guardian. Um, I'm, I'm a bit confused as to whether, whether we say that we're ready. So is that we're ready for disaster or does that include mitigation? Because currently we're seeing that we're ready, but in several regional corporations, some of the drains are still filled with slush. Um, there are culverts that are broken down. It's, it's flooding already. Um, even in the Penal Labor Regional Corporation, there are people living on the river banks, and for years they've been flooding out, and nothing has been done. They still, they still live on the river banks. The river banks. Um, last year, the Minister of Work said that they had a challenge in cleaning several rivers because uh, people have built on the river reserves. When we've checked this year, people still living on the river reserves. They have garages. They have all sorts of things inside there. Um, there are complaints that the river courses are being cleaned only close to bridges so when you go lower down it's still blocked up so is it that we're ready to handle the effects of a flood or did we mitigate for this and with regards to health um one of the things we noticed last year um especially down in the penal area is that people were trapped in their home for days uh, some of these people suffer from diabetes heart complications and uh, they had to wait until the water went down after two days before they could get some type of medical attention. So in terms of getting response to these people who are most at risk, uh, how are the responders or the health professionals going to reach these people in their homes? Right, so let me deal with the... ...deal with hearing me. Every individual who has a chronic disease, chronic disease means you have this disease for a long time and you will have it for a long time. Every individual with a chronic disease should have a supply of medication at home, not to last a day or two days, but you should have a supply of medication home to last you. So, Excellent question, and the message is every individual with a chronic disease, diabetes, or hypertension should make it their personal responsibility to have a supply of medication for at least a week, minimum a week, and that is not hard to do. So that's an excellent question, sir. I thank you for it, and make sure that message gets out. So until the responders can come, and until you could get a healthcare facility. And that is accepted protocol worldwide, that anybody with a chronic condition has a responsibility to themselves to keep an adequate supply. The same way we advise you to put your passport in a plastic bag, it's the same way. Make sure you have a supply of food, water, medication. Excellent question, I thank you very much. As referred to, it's the state of readiness as for Trinidad and Tobago. You refer to the issue of drains not being cleared, persons living on the river bank. That is a recurring issue that the respective agencies are working with. The Ministry of Works is and presently conducting cleaning of water courses through a structured program which was approved by Cabinet. So it is being done. Uh, they are now completing phase one of a three-phase project. So 
when I speak of readiness, it is the fact that as a state, we are ready. But our readiness would be dependent on how ready each individual is. So as the minister just spoke about the fact that persons who have chronic disease should have extra medication. If that person is, does not have extra medication, then that person is not prepared for a hazard impact. So we are ready as a state. The severity of the impact will test how ready our response agencies are, how ready the individuals within the community are, and therefore we appeal to persons to get ready and stay ready. Good morning, Good morning. Cindy Raguba, Tika Singh, TV6 News. News. Um, um, first to you, Captain, Captain Retired Wind. Um, um, I know I you know said you we're, we're ready, ready this year. year. Were we, we were ready, ready last year? year? Um, um, the reason I'm asking is in southern Trinidad, we're in south right now, um, they saw floods worse than maybe 60, 70 years, some of them. Um, were we ready? And why would that have been the problem? In the Pinal Debe Regional Corporation, they they recently got from the, embassy, the U.S. Embassy two dinghies to assist in getting to people. Um, do we have more equipment to get to people in the event that last year, sometimes four or five days, six, seven days in some communities, the water was not subsiding and you couldn't get in and there were no dinghies simply to get to them. Is that something we've worked on this year? Excuse Thank you for your question. The, yes, we were ready last year, and again, the severity of the impact did test our readiness. What you had last year was the issue of concentrating rainfall and, if possible, a 100-year cycle of a rain event in that particular area. You also had the case where persons, because of not having an impact, choose to build in areas that were not readily acceptable for building. So you had persons in the lagoon, you had persons building on the river banks, you had persons building in the river. So you had stills that were placed in the river. Um, basically, <laughs> persons just took advantage of that. So when you have what you, you call this concentrated rainfall and this one down here, you 100 year cycle, it is going to have an impact on persons and persons are were not ready to deal with that. The issue of your rules about the dinghy, there are equipment available to respond. In some cases, getting into some of those areas were challenging, and it would have delayed. Because of that, in the past, and we still continue, that we advocate that persons understand the 72 hour protocol which Trinidad Tobago operates under, where at least in some cases it might take as much as 72 hours for response agencies to get to you. So you too have to be prepared to withstand that particular impact. As a result, from the ODPM, we have made some adjustments to our procedures. We have collaborated with other agencies, um, and we are working very closely with agencies such as the Trinidad Tobago Defense Force, the fire service, and the municipal corporations to allow for a response but also understanding the severity and the incident action plan can delay the response to the respective persons. And we ask the population, again, to get ready, understand your responsibilities, but you will be attended to and agencies will respond to your needs. So even though we're ready, South Trinidad can expect, even with um, excessive rain, a repeat of last year? The issue of global warming has contributed to this phenomenon. I cannot say, yes, you're going to get it. South Trinidad might not experience what they experienced last year, but the possibility exists that it can occur again. And therefore, taking the experience of last year, all agencies of government, and I'm also appealing to all individuals to take the necessary steps, do sandbagging, protect your property. It's we're just going to change how the front of your house looks, but at least it's going to protect your assets. So we can expect it, but we ask persons to prepare for such an impact. Um, to the Minister of Health, I know you spoke of chronic diseases, but what of, um, you know, women pregnant or a heart attack, someone who might not have 
you know, be predisposed to the condition, you know, their house being flooded, being stressed, they can have a heart attack possibly. Um, or like, like I said, pregnant people. What about ambulances? Tell me of the people, not chronic, but you can have a health issue at any time and not have previously had a condition. Can you speak to that please? Well, we will hope that our first responders who have the dinghies and so on can bring these people to a elevated position on land where a land-based ambulance could take them to a hospital as soon as humanly possible. So that's why we have this interagency approach, because we realize that the Ministry of Health cannot do this and should not be doing this alone. So for your a direct answer to your direct question, we will have to rely on other agencies to pull these people out of their homes, over the floodwaters, to higher ground where a land-based ambulance can then render um, uh, primary health care services and then take them to the necessary secondary or tertiary facility. Can anyone at the table tell me, um, I cited the issue of no dinghies last year, can anyone say if there will be you know, equipment there to assist the ambulances to get these people out? Is there anybody can tell me that? While there were no dinghies available last year, there are dinghies available to sound response. I know the Toronto Tobago Fire Service has in their asset inventory dinghies, the Toronto Tobago Regiment Engineer Battalion has. So based on their deployment and its need, if needed, it can be deployed. The Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management also has dinghies that has been deployed through the Toronto Tobago Defense Force. So the assets is in country has been in country, but then again, it's based on incidents, response, it's spread across the entire island. So as the minister said, if there is such a case, it's an interagency collaboration to move those persons to higher ground to which uh, land-based assistance can be had to move those persons. But I want the population and you, the media, to understand also that the lives of the responding agencies is also has to be assessed. So yes, you have rising water, but you would not like to put the lives of those who are responding at risk. So there will be times where the response will be delayed based on what resources those agencies have and where they request for further support where that resource is coming from. Thank you. To Mr. Will, um, you didn't make men any mention of refuge, um, safe, safe, safe um, shelters, shelters. Um, you care to tell us, and also the minister, you made mention of mosquitoes. We are lay people. How long does a mosquito last? Um, lifespan is, and you said it four year, four months. You, you spray. You care to tell us if a mosquito is under four months, why not spray more often? Thank you for your question, sir. In my speech, I did make mention to the fact that the Ministry of Local Government, Rural Development and Local Government, has assured me that they are in the process of inspecting and will shortly publicize to the population where those shelters are. There are still existing shelters based on the database, and they have inspected and revised and even updated that shelter listing. Shelters are not hazard specific for Trinidad and Tobago. And each corporation has on its inventory a list of shelters that have been donated by the owners, those buildings, they are inspected. The ODPM stands ready to support the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government in the activation of those shelters in the supply, if needed, of cuts, blankets, emergency meals, clothing, hygiene kits. So once a shelter is activated by the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government in the impacted municipal corporation, those resources can be made available if it is needed. We had incidents, incidents where members were rejected from these shelters. You, you care to tell us if this will reoccur? I hope it does not reoccur, sir. However, there's a process in opening shelters. And if a shelter is open without the relevant line authority and information flow, that can happen. So if the CEO of a corporation, by extension the senior disaster coordinator or the disaster 
management unit within the corporation is not aware that a shelter is going to be open, then the necessary resources cannot be put in place. When a shelter is open, it requires medical support, law enforcement support, logistical support. So a shelter cannot just open because somebody has a key and open as a shelter. There's support mechanisms in there, and there's a time frame to which that decision has to be made. So I hope I have answered your question. With regards to the question related to the mosquito lifespan, the lifespan is generally for most species about a month. So they last a month. Minister alluded to one issue why we don't spray more often than that, and that is resistance, which is true. Um, with, as it relates to indoor residual spraying, um, some of you would have known insect vector control division would have entered your homes and sprayed a chemical onto the wall. Usually we use alpha symmetrin. That chemical is recommended by World Health Organization for indoor residual spraying. It lasts three to four months on the surfaces that we spray it upon. So it is not advisable to spray it once we apply um, then until the, the cycle is complete. So that is why we have to spray every four months. If we spray too often, there's human health effects that can take place if we, if we do that too often. So we have to hold on that. Yeah, just, 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 um, yeah. yeah, it's just that the Ministry of Local Government uh, has already listed their shelters and the public will be notified. Yeah. Um, now, we know that um, the rains last year and tropical storm breath, we didn't really get the full brunt of that weather system. So, now, you talked about um, bringing people to elevated area for a land-based ambulance or something to take it. But in the case where an uh, entire community or village is blocked off, I mean, what about air ambulances or helicopter services and those type of things? Um, and in terms of the health facilities, how are they staffed ahead of a, of a storm or a hurricane? I mean, will there be enough staff? And I mean, we're already, we, we still experience situations where you have overcrowding of emergency rooms and even wards. So in a case where you might have uh, increased need for medical services, how will the health facilities deal with that? Yeah. Right. With regard to the second part of your question, in terms of staffing of facilities, we tend to, we, we have developed after the, the ministry has hired a chief technical disaster coordinator, which she started in May of last year, I believe. Um, and out of that, we started to revamp our disaster preparedness plan. And part of it is actually making sure the facilities are up and running during any, any weather events. We would have seen in Toko last year um, facilities being inundated, people being cut off as well. And we have learned lessons out of it. Um, the helicopter air ambulance service is a possibility that we have, have looked at in at Eric Williams, their, their heliports and we can airlift people from strategic, strategically placed clear zones. So we have, have that as part of our plan as well. Um, with regards to cancellation of elective surgeries, just going towards emergency type events, we have done that. We have looked at the human resource component of it as well, so that in, everyone is, is human and we actually ask our staff, our staff have, have done human service last year, and continue to do so in these times. But we have put into place um, some human resource and industrial relations aspects into staffing proposals so that we can pay over time as well to these persons, and making sure that they have shelter, they have food at the facilities to last them during the event as well is important. Looking at things like um, generators within the facilities is being looked at. There's a concept of smart hospitals, smart health centers, which have been used in Dominica post their hurricane experience and other parts of the Caribbean, which we want to at least pilot in Trinidad as well, which means that it is run by solar electricity to the most part. Um, and definitely in the remote centers, it will actually help us a lot. So we're looking at a number of issues to, to keep our health facilities functioning during the events. Um, to expand an answer on your question, sir, what we do at the ministry to cater for surge demand, so in case of a natural disaster, you have a surge in demand, especially for cuts and bruises or lacerations or whatever, 
what we do in the days coming up to an event. We cancel all elective surgeries. So you send those patients home, so you free up space. Those are some of the measures we take to accommodate for surge demand. So everything that is not, what happens then, you move into critical mode. And every service that is non-critical, if it can be converted into a service for critical care, that is done. So that is how you cope with that surge demand at both a and &E and on both the wards. So if you need extra beds, you have these extra beds. So that is how we do it, um, and it's all protocolized. So we think uh, we are in a very good place health-wise to respond to any natural event. question really um, focused on how can members of the public get access to the chemicals that are put into containers um, to control um, mosquitoes. So if you can uh, um, It's not available to use. Basically, Aquatane and it's not available is for us to be able to use in terms of how we conduct the things that we do. You remember the minister spoke about different things. These things require training in terms of how you do this. It's not just go and buy a chemical and just drop it in water and create more issues for us and for everybody else. I'll also allow Dr. Prasaram to speak to this. Well, basically, it, the chemicals that we use are, again, recommended by WHO, but as Dr. Bellamy alluded to, they require that the staff that utilize the chemicals know the right quantities, and it requires quite a lot of training before you could actually use it. Um, so in the past, we have gotten numerous requests from Insect Vector Control Division to actually distribute the chemicals to the population and use it, but because of those reasons and to protect the safety of the drinking water, um, we have not allowed, and the policy still is, that we don't distribute the, the chemicals to the population at large. Again, there's an issue with resistance if we overuse it, so we have to be mindful of that as well. 